Well, uh, continuing our homily series on the liturgy, we're just going to uh, finish up hopefully today the penitential rite. Uh, you know, we're kind of stuck in the introductory rites here, but they're very compact with a lot of meaning in them. Uh, but first, to consider the ambo. This is the ambo, the, uh, the place where the gospel and the word of God, the readings, are read from, and where the homily is preached from. And it's not because of that, simply, you know, a podium or a lectern or a pulpit. It is, in a sense, like a second lesser altar. Because just as our Lord is truly present in the Eucharist, so He is truly present in His Word. Not, of course, substantially present the way He is in the Holy Eucharist, but He is truly present here nonetheless. And in a real way, He kind of sets the banquet of His Word for His people. So in a sense, uh, the ambo becomes like a second altar where we receive Christ in His Word. And so along with the altar and the chair, the ambo, they, these three pieces of liturgical furniture, they bring great balance to, uh, to our worship, not simply in an aesthetic sense uh, where they, they all look balanced out, but in a theological sense, you know, the three uh, murra, as they say, the three offices that the, tur the church has, that the priest has, are those of teaching, sanctifying, and governing. And that is what these three uh, pieces of furniture represent. Teaching, the ambo, where the word of God is taught. Sanctifying, the altar, where we receive that saving grace, which is Christ. And governance, the chair, which as we said, reminds us of the bishop and is a symbol of authority. And just as among those, you know, all of those are important, obviously we need all of them, but among them, sanctifying is of course the most important because it brings us into union with God. And so the altar is, of course, the most important, the central uh, focus of the liturgy. But uh, the ambo, which, by the way, refers, is from the Greek, referring to going up on a height or a mountain, which is why it's always Paul helps the priest's voice project before they had microphone systems. So, the, returning now to the penitential rite, we want to look at um, Form B, so you can all pull out your little sheets there, the second act of penance. And of course, as we said, the penitential rite is all about preparing ourselves, preparing ourselves to receive that sanctifying grace which is offered to us in the liturgy and purifying us from our sins. And although that doesn't have the same effect as sacramental confession, uh, it does purify us from our sins. And in fact, uh, you know, in the extraordinary form, I should have said this before, in the extraordinary form, uh, during the penitential rite, the priest actually makes the sign of the cross as a blessing. Now that's not, as we discussed before, the same thing as sacramental absolution, but that is why you know, people have the habit of, when the priest prays that prayer, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Many people still bless themselves there. So you don't really have to do that, because the priest doesn't give a blessing there anymore, and it's not a sacramental confession, but that's where it comes from. So, Form B. Form B uh, takes the form of a dialogue between the priest and the people. And the first, as you can see, the first uh, like versicle in response is the priest says, Have mercy on us, O Lord, and the people respond, For we have sinned against you. And this is uh, not a direct quotation from Scripture, but this is certainly the sense of many parts of the Scripture. That we have sinned, again, we acknowledge our sin in the penitential rite, and then we ask the Lord for mercy. So, for example, uh, Baruch, who was the prophet Jeremiah's secretary, has his own little book in the Bible. He, um, in his book, expresses the penitential spirit of the Jews who have been exiled to Babylon. And uh, he writes these words, Hear, O Lord, for you are a God of mercy, and have mercy on us, who have sinned against you, Baruch 3, 2. So you can see very close to what's there. Also in 1 Kings, when Solomon dedicates the temple, he says, he prays, forgive your people, Lord, who have sinned against you. So very much uh, this ancient sense is part of the church, even from uh, in the days of the Jews. Then the second versicle is, show us, O Lord, your mercy, and grant us your salvation. And this is actually a direct quote from Psalm 85, verse 8. And 
it is an ancient, ancient part of the liturgy, even uh, in the extraordinary form of the Mass, the old form, uh, this was part of the prayers at the foot of the altar that the priest would say along with the servers. This is, so this particular uh, quote from Psalm 85 goes way back in the church's liturgy. And it's, it's very important because already here in this reference to show us your salvation, already here in the penitential rite at the beginning of Mass, we are looking forward to that salvation when our Savior comes in the Holy Eucharist, Jesus Christ, truly present. And so this prepares us for what is going to happen in the liturgy. Now before we come to the, the final form, form C, which as you can see remains unchanged, um, we want to talk about, real quick about the Kyrie. And the Kyrie, you know, Kyrie a song, uh, is sung or said after either the I confess form A or the have mercy on us, O Lord, form B. And I have to laugh, you know, it's in, people say to me sometimes, you know, oh, are you the kind of person who likes a lot of Latin in the liturgy, like the Kyrie and things like that? And then I laugh, because of course, Kyrie, the lay song, is not Latin, it is Greek. And so, uh, it means, Lord, have mercy, obviously. But it is such an ancient, such a revered part of the liturgy, because way, way back, when the liturgy was all in Greek and then got translated into Latin, it alone remains of what was originally all Greek. And so it was this cry for mercy, which is so deeply embedded in the church's consciousness. So such an important part of the liturgy to cry out for mercy to the Lord that it alone has remained untranslated into the Latin. It still remains in the Greek. And so that is where it comes from, that is what it means. It is, of course, three invocations, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, which are repeated by the people, can be led by either the priest or the deacon. Um, and, of course, these can refer, Lord, Christ, Lord, can refer to our Lord, Jesus Christ, who is the one who brings us mercy. And certainly, uh, as we'll see in Form C of the penitential rite, that is what they usually do. But also, we can think of them as a reference to the Holy Trinity, right? Because all three persons of the Trinity are Lord and God. But only the second person of the Holy Trinity is Christ, who became man. And so we can think of it as well as a reference to Lord God the Father, have mercy on us. Christ God the Son, have mercy on us. And Lord the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. So. That's, that's there uh, as well. And in fact, it, in the extraordinary form, they do this, it's not a, a double repetition, but it's a triple repetition. And so that brings out even more of the Trinitarian meaning. And remember we said three is a, is a special emphasis thing in the liturgy. And so this Lord Christ, Lord is again, this special emphasis on the mercy that we ask in the liturgy. So finally, to get to form C, what Form C does is it takes the Kyrie to lay on and incorporates it in with different strokes. Uh, and these different strokes apply to different seasons uh, of the year, different occasions, special feasts, things like that. So they uh, bring us into the mystery that we are celebrating. And then uh, the, the, this is the one form of the penitential rite that the deacon can lead, uh, as Deacon Paul often does because it is, you know, part of the Kyrie is matched with it, and so it becomes not strictly a prayer of a priest. So, all of this, again, is simply to say that in the liturgy, we come before our Lord for mercy. We come to prepare ourselves to receive His saving grace. And so, as we come before Him today, let us do that. Let us open our hearts, acknowledge our sins, and receive His saving grace.